Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. That's right. Three Martinis. We got the, the good, the bad, the crazy, as always. Chad Benson in for uh, Greg, who is on a much needed rested time. And uh, as always, Jim Garrity is good to join us. And Jim, let's jump straight at it. We're going to start with the good. And the good is. Is anybody paying any attention to Omicron slash coronavirus? Because quite frankly, uh, 100,000 plus cases above, not so much anymore. Yeah. So good news on two fronts of the virus. I think we can now safely say the Omicron wave is pretty much done. We're now below actually 100,000 cases per day. Uh, We're now pretty much close to where we were before the Omicron case arose. Now, look, I'm not saying... Uh, the Omicron wave was bad, uh, no two ways about it, but you know, cases are down 66% in the last two weeks. The daily average up on the New York Times chart is 81,000 cases per day. Positive rate on tests is down 8%. Hospitalizations is down 44%. ICU use down 41%. And deaths are down 24%. All good news. And one other indicator, because remember, not that long ago, if you were a governor, particularly if you're a Republican governor, and you wanted to rescind an indoor mask mandate... You were a dangerous lunatic and you wanted people to die and you simply didn't care. And, you know, why weren't you listening to the CDC? And according to you say today, 49 states have announced plans to adopt their indoor mask mandates. And the only holdout remains to be Hawaii. Uh, And not all of them have dropped them yet. A lot of them have announced it in, you know, the coming week or two. But by and large, look, you know, as I mentioned, hospitalizations are down, deaths are down. Omicron has gone through. Everybody should have plenty of antibodies in their system for a while. And it's very easy in the news cycle to feel like you're going from one crisis to another, from the Omicron crisis to the Russia invading Ukraine crisis. We should take a moment and say, hey, Omicron's gone. We've gotten through it. And this should be a good spring to come. Yeah. Look, we got to start living above this thing. It's just going to be endemic. It means it's going to be here and we're going to have to learn to to live with it and understand that it's going to be just like winter when we get, you know, the flu season. These things are going to happen. I was looking at a poll, I think it was a Gallup poll last week, and they were talking about the things going into the election in the midterms, the big things. Number two, after, of course, the economy and tied with with education was not coronavirus, Jim, it was reaction to the coronavirus. I think the fear is is people are worried that the minute there's a little bump up in something or cases or a new quote unquote you know variant, uh, that the reactions are going to be overreaching. Yeah, that, that that sense of waiting for that other shoe to drop. And it did not some of this probably is a reflection of what happened in 2021. People got vaccinated. The message was if you got vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks anymore. And then the Delta wave came along late summer, early uh, autumn, and the, a whole bunch of restrictions came back into place. Now, I spent last weekend in Austin, Texas, I admittedly the bluest part of a very red state. Uh, but I got to tell you, you know, back there, it was beautiful weather. Everybody's outside. It's kind of weather like you choose to eat outside. You're not choosing outside because you have to because of restrictions of, of coronavirus or anything. And it just felt like, you know, the, the pandemic was done and gone. It's a very different feeling than here in Northern Virginia. It was just this much more laid back vibe. And I think that's what people are ready for. I think people are going to be responsible enough. And I think it's long past time for people to be trusted to make their own decisions. Amen. I mean, you know, we should be sleeping on that, if you know what I mean. Ah, what a perfect uh, uh, segue there, Chad. Yes, you know. Who doesn't love a great deal? Because now when you click on the My Listeners page and enter the promo code MARTINI over at MyPillow, there are more than 20 deals for you to choose from. Their current offers include MyPillows for as low as $19.98, the My Slippers at 50% off, the MyPillow Towel Sets at their lowest price ever, just $39.99, up to 60% off any of the Giza Dream Sheets with a price as low as $39.99, or a free book with the promo code MARTINI. You will find all of these offers and more at MyPillow.com. Click the radio listener square and use the promo code MARTINI at checkout. Or you can call 1-800-874-0104. Right now, every order using the promo code MARTINI will receive Mike Lindell's new book, What Are the Odds? From Crack Addict to CEO Free. MyPillow.com, promo code MARTINI. Or you can call 1-800-874-0104. And don't forget that promo code, Martini, for your free book.
So we move from uh, the good to the bad. And, you know, when you send me these things today, I agree 100 percent with what you wrote. Uh, the sanctions that were put on, uh, underwhelming to say the least. I just spoke a little while ago to Mike Lyons, a uh, military analyst, former retired, you know, uh, Army major. And he said, no war has ever been won a little bit at a time. And if you're going to go hard, sanctions need to be hard, fast, and everything you have now, and then unwind them. Don't give Putin more chances to continue to profit while he's building up and attacking. Indeed, Chad. And I think what's really frustrating about this is the sheer number of times over the past two or three months we've heard President Biden, Vice President Harris, Secretary of State Blinken, all using I'm running the same phrase, that our response will be swift and severe, swift and severe sanctions, swift and severe consequences. It's this mantra. And then when we finally got them, the first thing is that apparently this is the first tranche of sanctions. Uh, this is the first wave. This is the first category. Don't worry, more are coming. Okay, first, that, that's fine if you want to do that. But at the same time, you're also not doing everything at once. That's not swift and severe. That is a slow, gradual, moderate escalation of sanctions. It is not the swift and severe response that you've promised. I, I don't. I have no real objections to the ones that were announced yesterday, although I point out the two banks that they picked are the ones that are probably most closely tied to the Russian military and to the Kremlin, which makes sense to start with them. But you still have at least six of the largest banks in Russia uh, currently untouched. Now, they may add them in the very near future. I, I, you know, that, that's fine, but it's just kind of a sense of like, why are you dribbling these out bit by bit? Nothing on Russian oil and gas uh, exports to the U.S. Oh, by the way, they dramatically increased their oil and gas exports to the U.S. over the course of 2021. I'm sure a lot of Americans are asking, wait a minute, we, we were energy independent like two years ago. Why are we so dependent on Russian oil and gas? Why aren't we developing more of our own energy resources? Why aren't we doing more to replace them and to bring down their use of, of the ability to use energy as a weapon against Europe and other places? Uh, you know, just a baffling lack of, of strategic thinking there. And then uh, nothing, nothing about access to the SWIFT, which is the big international banking transition system, which would effectively basically builds a wall between the Russian economy and the rest of the world. It makes it very hard to move money in and out. And then today in the corner, I wrote another one. After the Soviets shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007 back in the 80s, we barred Russian airlines from landing in U.S. airports. And then the other one which kind of jumped out is that uh, this is one of the easiest ones. There are children of Russian government officials and Russian oligarchs who like to go to school here in the United States, either you know, pre-college and university boarding schools or going to Columbia University, Harvard, Ivy Leagues and stuff like that. It's time to send those kids home. Sorry, if your dad is helping Putin, get the heck out of my country. And the first time I said that, I did not use the word heck. You know, it's kind of like, this is the simplest, easiest way of hitting the oligarchs in a way that's going to really hurt them. It's going to hit them in a way that they're noticed. If you are being a participating in this or you are supporting this invasion, you are not going to get educated here in the United States of America. There are lots of other fine kids who can go and take that slot that you got over in the Ivy Leagues or something like that. All of these are steps the Biden administration could do, and conceivably they could do this in the next couple of weeks or, or days or months. But again, I don't understand why you're dribbling this stuff out. And it certainly doesn't seem likely to deter Putin. And it's even worse when you've spent several months talking about how tough these sanctions are going to be. And he spent the last eight months to a year putting anywhere between 750 and a trillion dollars away and to help out the oligarchs, to help out some of these companies. And we know you're not going to be able to get it all. And you've aligned yourself with a bunch of other people who are who are a den of thieves and thugs who are going to help you along the way. But this just seemed to be kind of a scenario that when you look at it, you're like, and Putin, look, he understands. He gets it. And he doesn't care. That's the other side. There's only so much you can do to a guy who, quite frankly, doesn't care all that much. Yeah, I, you know, yesterday's morning jolt was all kind of exploring this idea of Vladimir Putin does not seem like a guy who's deterred by economic sanctions. He, you know, we talked about this yesterday, this idea that he thinks he's fighting for something greater than money or the state of the Russian economy or something like that. So it's entirely possible that no amount of sanctions would get the result that we want. But if you're going to enact sanctions, enact sanctions, and if you're going to spend all this time talking about how tough they're going to be, well, then by golly, they had better be tough. And we're not really getting that. 
And I think really the only thing that can possibly deter a further Russian invasion is for us to basically turn all of the roads from uh, Poland leading into Kiev and Ukrainian territory, just long convoys of arms and, and just let the Russians know every inch of Ukrainian soil you take is going to cost you. And maybe that will deter him from going too far. All remains to be seen right now, Chad. Let's switch to crazy, crazy at home, crazy in Oklahoma. And uh, let's just say a mom had too much to drink at a sleepover. Yeah, this, it's not just any mom. So if you think you're having a bad day or maybe you had a rough weekend or something like that, U.S. House candidate in Oklahoma, a Democrat, has apologized after reports she became intoxicated at a Valentine's Day weekend sleepover for middle school aged girls, berated several of the children and vomited in a hamper. And this is from the Associated Press account. I read a different account that said, in addition to vomiting in the hamper, Democrat Abby Broyles, who's running for the House in Oklahoma, actually vomited on one of the girls or in some of her shoes. I've heard differing accounts. The point is that a lot of vomiting happening, and that's not the sort of uh, event you'd like your candidate to be associated with. The parents, at least one of the girls who were at the sleepover, told an online news outlet that Broyles used profanity. Okay, lots of parents do that. Berated several of the 12 and 13 year old girls at the party. Well, that's not good. Commenting on one girl's acne. Okay, now I think we see the alcohol talking. And another's Hispanic ethnicity. Flashing neon sign. This is not a good candidate. You don't want to do this. Um, and then she got a traditional. First of all, you initially denied that she'd uh, done any of this. Then Abby Broyles has said in a uh, television station that she used to work for, she had an adverse reaction after drinking wine and taking sleep medication given to her by a friend. Uh, and she doesn't remember anything she did and, and all that stuff. Now, I, you know, I, I'm really having a tough time. This seems like the cleanest version of events. And I'm sorry I vomited in your shoes is a really difficult statement for anyone to make, particularly a U.S. House candidate. But here's the thing. If from now until Election Day, you have a candidate you love, you're really pulling for him, you think they got a shot, and they have a bad day on the campaign trail, at least they haven't had to apologize for vomiting on middle schoolers. That's a really bad day for your candidate. That's a super bad day. But it's always one of those things those kids could say if she wins is, hey, she threw up on me. <laughs> when reached for comment, Broyles said, bah. <laughs> Fun, man. We had the good, we had the bad, and we had the crazy. It's always good to join you. Uh, this is, of course, Three Martini Lunch, uh, Jim Garrity, and I'm in for Greg Karamas. Jim, if people want to reach you and get you on the old internet and get the morning jolt, how do they do that? You can find it at nationalreview.com. I'm on Twitter at Jim Garrity. Last name is spelled G-E-R-A-G-H-T-Y. Blame Ellis Island for not changing it. And in the corner all day long, the Morning Jolt newsletter and uh, find podcasts like this one. Absolutely. And uh, follow me at Chad Benson Show. It's uh, great to be with you. We'll do it again tomorrow. Thanks so much. Looking forward to it, Chad. Thanks, man. Hi, I'm Sarah Carter, host of the Sarah Carter Podcast. Everywhere you look these days, we're seeing an aggressive effort to destroy what made America great, tearing down our history, attacking our freedoms, and canceling any person who dares to cross the progressive speech police. We cannot stand by and let this happen. It's time for the silent majority to become the unsilent majority. Join me on the Sarah Carter Podcast. Subscribe at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.